I'm live. Oh my gosh. Hi everyone. My name is Santiago Sanchez, for those of you who don't know me, which I guess is a lot, but um, I think a lot of my friends, even some of my family in Colombia is going to log on, so I'm a little nervous about that. It's the first time they're seeing any of my writing or hearing any of my writing. Um, hi to everyone in the comments. Um, I'm going to give some time for some people to log on and then I'll get started. I'm probably going to read for about seven, eight minutes. Um, I'm going to read from the short story of mine that's in this issue. It's called In This Life or Another. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I just graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop in fiction. Um, I'm staying here for another year, so I'm still in Iowa City and I'll be here teaching maybe fiction? I don't know. I don't know what I'll be teaching exactly, um, but I'll be teaching something this next year. Um, feeling pretty nervous about, you know, going back to classes and whatnot. It's kind of insane. Hi, Jamie. Oh my gosh. Hi. Oh, I'm getting so many friends slogging on. This is so sweet. I'm so happy. Um, yeah. I want to give some thanks to Claire Boyle, who edited my story for this piece, and it was such a pleasant experience working with her. Um, and also to Dan Weiss, who put this all together and who's helped me log on with everything and make sure I knew what I was doing. Hi, Anna. Oh, all these sweeties. I'm so happy. <laughs> Um, and I also wanted to thank Holly Andres, who did all the photos for the issue. It was so bizarre and special to see an image from, like, the story be represented by someone else. Um, I'm also a photographer, so it's, it's always strange having, like, a piece of view represented by someone else. Um, so this reading series is going to go on for the next two weeks. I think the first person read yesterday, and I might be the second. Uh, but tomorrow, Chelsea Hicks is going to be reading at the same time. Um, so come check her out. That'll be, what time is this? Like 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. West, West Coast, Pacific. Um, she'll be reading and then people will be reading for the next two weeks. And you can check out any of the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, to see who's reading when. Um, Part of this is also like having like a QA, and a um, but we're going to keep it a little informal. So if you have any questions, I encourage you as you're listening, as I'm reading, um, to just type them in and I'll go through and answer at the end um, whatever questions you have. So you can get those in while I'm reading or at the end. Um, and I'll probably take just a few so I can go have dinner because I'm so hungry. Um, there's also some other things to let you guys know about. There's some discount codes that have been made for the issue um, that I should share with you. There's one, um, one discount code is gonna be posted, I guess. Okay, the link is gonna be posted on McSweeney's story after the reading, and it's like a subscription um, discount, discount, and it gives you 20, $20 off the subscription. Um, and it starts you off with this issue instead of issue 61. Um, and there's another one just for this issue. Um, and the code for that is photos. The code for the subscription one is Instagram. Just this issue is photos. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I, my, my dad said he was gonna log on and that made me so nervous. I don't know if he is already on, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, there's four characters in this story, and it's told from the point of view of the boy. So it's the boy, the brother, the mother, and the father. Um, I'm gonna read from about like, I guess the middle of the story. So I'll give you a little bit of context. This is taking place in Colombia. Um, it's like in the late nineties, there's some violence and stuff going on, um, but it's all sort of from the point of view of the boy. So he doesn't have really like the language to talk about what what he's seeing. Um, and I'm going to read from a passage that starts, the story starts on a Friday. I'm going to read from Saturday. 
Um, the mother was supposed to pick the boy up from school on Friday, but she never showed up. Um, so the, and this is something that has happened before. So the story starts on Saturday and it's the brother, the older brother and the boy hanging out. Um, and yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. So I'm gonna start. I'm gonna take a sip of my martini first. Okay. Inside of the brother's red plastic lunchbox, there are several lighters and a tin jar with a crank and a small book with sheer crinkling pages. The plastic bag filled with the green nuggets of stuff is already on the table. The brother rolls a cigarette right next to the wooden coasters and the picture of them in Miami without the father. You're gonna breathe easy, the brother says. The boy enjoys it when the brother talks like this, an instruction rather than explanations. What a fate, to know what to do. He taps his foot to the beat of their victory as he watches the cigarette form thin and even like a thin pencil between the brother's fingers. When it's finished, the scruffy end catches the flame of the lighter and the brother blows on the tip until it's a slow, crack slow crackling orange. I think another detail I forgot to mention, they've been playing Mario Kart, so there's gonna be mentions of Mario and Luigi. Um, okay, so it's a slow crackling orange. It's gonna hurt at first, but you'll get used to it, says the brother. The boy wants to laugh at the serious face the brother makes as he sucks in a breath through the cigarette. With his eyes closed and brow furrowed, he looks just like the mother. When the brother opens his eyes and pulls the boy's chin toward him, the boy is caught off guard. His chest heaves. They are so close they are almost kissing. The smoke transfers between their mouths, a bridge. He's surprised by how the smoke fills him, how he can hold only so much of it in his mouth and lungs. His lungs spasm as if he's about to cry or laugh overwhelmed by some elemental feeling. Now hold it. The brother stands up, grooving his hips, filled by music and smoke. On the TV, Mario continues to jump in place, a golden trophy raised over his head. The brother adds a shimmy to Mario's victory dance, raising his arms above his head and stomping his feet as if firecrackers were going off. Watching him before another thought can follow, the boy feels his lungs expand. He closes his eyes and finds a pink room inside of himself. He prickles with the newness of the secret room, its walls glazed and pulsing. As the vision begins to fade, he opens his eyes, he exhales, he doesn't know where he has just gone. He looks at the strangeness of the house through the fog. A rod of light shoots through the kitchen window. The long white arm resurrects a soul from the sink and all over the house through the windows, long white fingers are touching things here and there. A fly on the silverware, sharp and green as an emerald the white china haloed in orbs. I think I'm high, he says, but the brother laughs, tells him not yet, and take it easy. The brother takes another puff. He lets the smoke lip slip out like dragon breath from the sides of his mouth, unspooling and rising to the beams of the ceiling, where it begins to collect into a face, the face of the mother. He should point it out to the brother now, share with him this vision, this ghost, this threat. Instead, he wills a breeze through the windows and forces the smoke apart into a vague, bright blob holding the two of them as brothers together. Having saved them from danger, he feels he's earned more. One more, he says, he wants more. He wants to see the pink room again. Another rule is broken when he stands on the couch. The springs bounce under his feet, 
He's as tall as the brother, but when he reaches for the cigarette, the brother swipes his hand away. His cheek stings with the shape of the brother's hand. He slapped him just hard enough to assert himself. Who's a little man now? asked the brother. His hands make a cone around his ear. Huh? I don't hear you. I said, who's a little man? Me, he shouts. I am a little man. That's right, says the brother. A slim flame shoots up from the lighter. The brother inhales from the cigarette again. A cow moves from a shed across a stream across the line of trees from the farm stretching out over the mountains. And then there's music too, strange music, becoming louder and louder. He dances while the brother puffs on the cigarette, thinking of being near the brother's mouth again, of finding more and more and more rooms within himself. He thinks he's willed it when the front door swings open. They whip their necks towards the world outside, a sheet of white, it's impossible to see anything, anything. He can imagine what will happen next. The gorillas have reached them, even here in the mountains, the one place they were supposed to be safe. The gorillas will force them out into the jungle, train them to carry guns and sleep in hammocks strung between trees. In his mind, these future days shimmer with possibility. With the gorillas, they will rob the father of his tools, leaving the roads unfinished. And without a job, the father will have no choice but to return home. The mother will no longer need to visit. We, the boys, will bathe in rivers, he says to himself. We will be revolutionaries. The idea exhilarates him. He straddles the back of the sofa like a horse, his legs kicking at either side, beating the wooden mane with his fists. And when he yells across the house, he does as only a little man can. We are ready. Through the, ha through the haze of smoke, the street resolves, it resolves itself. And there in the driveway, he makes out the mother's car with the windows rolled down, the radio still blasting a cumbia. The shape of the mother appears backlit in the door frame, her face dark, her body compact and neat and sharp. She takes a wide step inside, leaving the door ajar. She limps past them and his horse. In the kitchen, a finger of light touches her face, right under her eyeball. An open gash fills with gold. She stomps across the landing, as if crushing a swarm of roaches beneath her heels. She shimmies out of her dress, inspects the garment under the light, fingering the hole in its side when she finds it. She splits the dress open until it's like the hide of an animal, symmetrically filleted. She drops it on the table, on the tall skinny table, over the black, the black and white communion portrait of the brother. She snaps her head toward the front door at the sound of laughter. The band is saying their goodbyes over the radio. She doesn't see him or the brother. They have become invisible. Her purse hangs heroically from her hands. The radio goes silent. The idling motor of the forgotten car takes over. The emptiness filled by the mechanical rumble and for a moment, recognition flickers on her face, like she's about to come to her senses. She's left the car on. These are her sons, smoking in the living room. But instead, she drops her purse on the ground. The compacts and lipsticks and brushes erupt across the floor. The heels come off last, so brilliantly red, so alive, so much like bloody pieces freshly torn from her body that their hearts sink. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh. Wow. 
this was one of the first stories I ever read and it still makes me so emotional to read it. It sort of fictionalizes um, the reason or the like events before my family moved to Colombia. Um, but I've totally made this up and I feel so embarrassed that my family is here because they know how not like the truth it is. <laughs> Um, thank you all. Oh my gosh. Anna, Ruben, Melissa. Hi, babe. Oh, I miss your face so much. Um, okay. Ada. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them. Um, I can speak a little bit about the story or my other writing. Otherwise, I don't know. You can just, I can just talk at you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I feel so emotional, this story, uh, all of my writing for those of you who, it's so weird, I've been in workshop for like the last few years, so my, my classmates just like know what my stories are like, um, can I show off the photos? Yeah, I'll grab the issue, I'll be right back. So the photos are from one of the first scenes in the story. Um, and the story begins with the boy waiting at school for somebody to pick him up. Um, and as he's waiting, he starts like playing with his lunchbox. He draws his mother. Um, so you can kind of see it here. The lunchbox, the banana peel, and here, you can see him making a very rudimentary drawing of his mother. <laughs> um, and there's one more photo, I think, at the very end. Or no, I think there was one more photo. I saw another photo, but you guys can't see it. <laughs> um, it's so sweet. That's my dad there, Jorge Sanchez. Um, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Okay, um, did anybody else have anything? Any other questions? Um, no, just lots of love. Ugh, my heart. I was sort of dreading this the whole day. I hate reading, but it's so nice to just see all this love. My dad's like trying to request to come on video with me, but I'm not gonna subject anybody to that. <laughs> but I love you, dad, and I love you. That's my aunt right there. Okay, um, what surprised you while writing this story? Um, jeez. I guess I, like, this was one of those that just took me a lot of time, and I wrote so many different scenes for it, and I guess what surprised me was that this was really, writing the story was an experience on, like, learning how to write, and, and, and really just writing a lot more than I, like past the point that I think something is finished. Um, and it was sort of arranging all the pieces um, and, and, and coming to ha find the shape of a story like that. Um, that was, yeah, the most surprising part. Um, Uh, Jamie's question, what does fictionalizing this period let you do or free from your actual history? This is one of like the, I don't know, like this is, I often think of my life like as a tree like branching out and and I think of so much of like who I am like started with like this moment. Um, so I always come back to it and it's always a moment that's in my head and there's a moment that there's so many reasons to it. and. I think, well, leaving Colombia and coming to Miami was a traumatic experience that I really don't have many memories from. So also like just being able to write about this moment and to imagine it, even if I know like, you know, I get the stories from my mother, I've heard the stories from, from my brother and from my father, but getting to create my sort of own emotional like memory, um, is what draws me back to that. 
Yeah. It's so funny. All my stories are like auto fiction and going back on points of my life, but I actually have a ter terrible memory. So, so much of it for me is really sort of going back and, and getting some sort of, I don't know, creating my own memories. <laughs> Mmm, I put like way too many olives in this and I love it. I know, this is so emotional for me. Um, okay, so if nobody has another question in like 10 seconds, I'm gonna wrap up. <laughs> and I'm so hungry, mmm. Okay, so tomorrow, like I said, Chelsea Hicks is gonna be reading um, at the same time. And yeah, just check the McSweeney's info. Oh my god, Jamie, I'm not crying. <laughs> um, yeah, check back for more info on the other readings. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, do you guys just want to watch me eat for like the next 30 minutes? No. Eat? Eliana, is that a yes? <laughs> Okay, I love y'all. Thank you everyone for coming. Can you hear me chewing? Yeah. <laughs> That's so, wow. I love that. Okay, bye.